In the past, I've experimented with a couple of different rocket plane designs. One I launched from a ramp. Another I flew with an electric motor before igniting a rocket motor in the tail. I'd like to develop this rocket plane program further with the much larger engines I now have available to me. So I've started to develop a brand new aircraft with some interesting new features. A big thank you to Stereo for sponsoring this week's video. More about them later on. Firstly, I tested some simple gliders. My previous orange rocket plane had a fairly standard configuration with a set of wings in the middle and a tail at the rear. It flew very well at high speeds. For my new rocket plane, I wanted to experiment with a large delta wing design with canards at the front for extra control. These types of models typically exhibit excellent maneuverability at slow speeds. This can be demonstrated by this extremely aerobatic model that I built a couple of years ago. Okay, it does have thrust vectoring motors in place of canards, but you get the idea. So I had a design in mind, but before jumping ahead and building it at full size, I realized it might be a sensible idea to to construct a scale model of the full-size aircraft to test its real-world performance. It would be a model of a model, if you will. I drew up some two-dimensional designs in Adobe Illustrator before cutting out all of the foam pieces I would need to construct the airframe. I 3D printed a lightweight nose cone from standard PLA to the same diameter as a BT-80 model rocket fuselage tube, which is at the heart of this particular build. I marked the tube with a pencil before cutting slots so I could neatly marry the foam board wing and the fuselage together. These were bonded in place with super glue before I glued some vertical stabilizers to the wingtips. I glued some canards over a carbon fiber spar for structural rigidity. To help me pilot the aircraft, I set up a Runcam Split FPV system. The Runcam Split camera is great for these small scale applications as the camera itself has a very small frontal area with its main PCB detached. Taking a micro SD card, however, it works just like a larger action camera. Initially, I had intended to make the model a simple glider that could be dropped from another aircraft and piloted to the ground using radio control, a little like my space shuttle from two years ago. To keep things simple though, and to test how the model would behave under rapid acceleration, I decided I would fly this aircraft with a small rocket motor, launching it from the ground. I added a mount at the tail for another camera to capture a separate rearward angle, because who doesn't want to see flames and a smoke trail? On the underside, I fixed a rail that would slide onto my launch ramp. Unfortunately, when it came time to test this model, the weather had turned foul, as usual. Postponed for now, I decided to wait and instead turn my attention to the full-scale rocket plane. Perhaps the small test model could later be used for pilot training. Before going into all of that, it's time for a quick ad from Stereo, a first of its kind live podcasting app. I've been using this app recently to record long format podcasts. If you like these YouTube videos and you'd like to see a bit more of the behind the scenes or hear about the behind the scenes of what it takes to make YouTube videos, then click the link in the description and download the app. I really like the app as I can talk about things on there that are just too time consuming to fit into a 10 minute YouTube video. I've already hosted two live shows on there, the first with my friend Mike who helps me make Project Air videos and the second one with my friend DIY Perks who kindly joined me to chat about all things YouTube, growing a YouTube channel and yeah, what it's like to make videos. I mean, I think if anyone um, starts a YouTube channel, they will definitely benefit from having a specific space for it. Um, I mean, yeah. it depends on what kind of content they want to make. If it's sort of just like vlogs and things, then obviously you don't necessarily need a specific um, room to do that in. But if you need to actually work in more of an office type environment, then it, it definitely helps to have a space that you can then evolve to fit your own workflow. And you'll only know what is useful for you once you start because um, then you come across problems that you'll have to find solutions for. I'm going to be doing another show at eight o'clock on Friday. So click the link in the description box, sign up, follow me on there and join me. And you can submit questions live and yeah, we'll have a bit of a conversation. Now on with the rocket plane build. Because I didn't have any large diameter model rocket tubes, I thought it would be interesting to build a plywood airframe structure for the fuselage. Unfortunately, the resulting airframe was far weaker than it 
expected and slightly wobbly due to a few errors with the cut files. So I went back to the drawing board, taking the opportunity to rethink how I was going to build a super sturdy airframe that would stand up to some abusive landings, should such a rare occurrence befall this plane. I cut some new parts from thicker plywood and got to work assembling them. The new design is based around this incredibly strong carbon tube. The formers of the fuselage can be passed along it and glued into place. To get a perfect fit on each former, I first cut a kerf compensation indicator to find out what the ideal diameter should be for the holes in each former. Instead of printing an entirely new nose cone for this project, I realised I had this second hand cone that would fit the design perfectly. It was only slightly damaged from a previous project that met an untimely demise. I built the wing for this aeroplane using foam and a carbon spar. This spar will enormously increase the number of Gs the aircraft can take in a turn. I next cut strips of thin plywood by hand and glued them to the top of this panel. You'll see why in a minute. Another panel was then glued onto the top, creating a plywood and carbon sandwich. You might notice that the wing at this stage is a little blunt, but this wasn't a problem. Running the blade at an angle using the ply core as a guide, I could remove material before sanding the leading edge into shape. I wrapped thick card around the shape of the formers. At this point, I hadn't installed any of the control or FPV camera electronics, so I didn't completely close off every section. The engine mount was added to the rear of the craft. The foam wing could now be glued to the underside. Servos for the elevons, which are the combined elevator and aileron control surfaces on the wing, were positioned in cutouts. For the canards, carbon rods were passed through their mounting holes underneath these electronics, which are the brushed ESC for the ignition of the rocket motor mid-air, and the BEC, which provides 5 volts to the radio control system receiver. Wingtip mounted vertical stabilizers were securely glued to each wing. I now mounted the FPV camera and transmitter in place and soldered wires to run power down the aircraft from the nose. Although this plane will not fly nearly as fast as my two-stage rocket, this aircraft has to stand up to speeds over 200 miles an hour. It will have to survive at these velocities without being torn apart. For this reason, I decided to fiberglass some areas of the model. I'll leave a list of items I used on this build in the description. I mixed the resin and catalyst before testing some foam offcuts to make certain I wasn't about to melt all of my hard work. I used some 100 gram glass cloth here and tried some at first on this test sample. I'm pleased to say nothing dramatic occurred, so I began layering up the underside of the fuselage. If you've never done this before, like I hadn't, I can describe the experience as being much easier than imagined, and almost like a grown-up paper mache. The main part of the aircraft I wanted to strengthen were the winglets. It is very important that these remain attached to the aircraft. Unfortunately, the DIY shop had run completely out of X1 orange, so I opted for bright yellow instead. With this, I found from experience it's best to do a few light coats, taking your time and exercising lots of patience. All that remained was to add some stickers, hook up the control surfaces and see how the finished aircraft turned out. The aircraft is now finished and ready for its maiden flight into the unknown. I have my FPV system working, my Patreon's names are all displayed in full view on one of the vertical stabilizers, and I've also mixed and tuned the control surfaces. Here's how I've set up the controls on this aircraft for now. When you work the elevator to pitch the aircraft up or down, both the wing surfaces and the canards actuate together to work as the elevator. For roll control, only the ailerons function. It seems we have a really solid aircraft here, and I for one can't wait to see it flying on this G motor, which is the same type that launched my two-stage rocket a couple of months ago. In spite of the rather crude aerodynamics and the inherently draggy airframe, I don't think we're going to have a slow aeroplane on our hands. Um, so yeah, 
very excited. If you're wondering when I'm going to be flying this. Well, I'm keeping a close watch on the weather. When the sun comes out and the wind dies down in the next few days, I'm going to be taking the small scale aircraft up first, testing that out and then perhaps doing the, uh, the full size one. A massive thank you again to Stereo for sponsoring this week's video. Make sure to join me on Friday at eight o'clock for my next live podcast. Uh, download the app in the description. Thank you very much to my patrons, of course. Subscribe, click the like button on your way out and maybe watch some more of my videos. I'll see you on the next one.